ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that we start the session two under the topic of the China factor, the PRC DPRK uh, relations. My name is Jun Young Sun, a professor of the University of North Korean Studies and the former Korean ambassador to the United Nations. It is great honor and pleasure for me to preside over uh, this important session under the topic uh, I mentioned. China has grown uh, continuously economically and politically. The Sino-American relationship has been and will continue to be crucially important um, impact on the peace and security in the Northeast Asian region. The economic interdependence between China and the United States has continued to grow, and the China will continue to increase its share in the global economic system. China's evolution toward democratization seems to be inevitable in line with the advancement of its market force economy and its uh, globalized economic uh, system. China has traditionally maintained a special relationship with North Korea. And recently, the China has provided North Korea with life-supporting economic assistance in particular. It is important to know uh, which the stability or denuclearization of North Korea uh, has the priority from the strategic perspective of China, fundamentally. These are some of the factors uh, we may have to bear in mind in addressing uh, this particular uh, session under the topic of China factor, China, uh, North Korea relations. We have uh, four distinguished panelists, Mr. James Parson from the Woodrow Wilson Center and Professor uh, Chu Feng of Beijing University of China and Professor Robert Sutter of Georgetown University, and Professor Samuel Kim from Columbia University. For the details of these distinguished panelists, I refer you to either Google or Wikipedia. <laughs> we, we, we distributed a list this morning. Right? <laughs> Google. <laughs> well, um, each presenter will be given strictly a 15 minutes time limit so that we may have um, efficient um, interaction between the audience and the podium, which is very important part of our discussion in the absence of any designated commentators. Now, I would like to invite uh, James Parson. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sun. I will certainly try to keep it within the 15 minutes. I am a historian, however, and uh, we tend to go over, don't we? Right, um, I'm gonna try to provide some historical perspective um, to, to uh, uh, Sino DPRK um, relations before our, our, the, uh, the rest of the speakers discuss uh, cur more current issues. Um, the year 2009 marked the 60th anniversary of Sino DPRK relations. China and North Korea celebrated the occasion with a series of, of high level meetings, uh, exchanges of over 120 delegations, and a number of economic and military agreements. We mustn't read too much into these celebrations and agreements made over the course of this year, however. The alliance that Mao Zedong once described as being as close as lips and teeth is in fact littered with 60 years of tension and conflict. However, the conventional wisdom, at least in Washington, um, is that North Korea and China have remained 
staunch allies ever since tens of thousands of Chinese People's Volunteers intervened in the Korean War in 1950 to save the DPRK from being wiped off the face of the earth. Because of China's support to North Korea from 1950 to 1953, and because of a supposed ideological affinity, many assume that China and North Korea remain very close and that China has more political leverage and, and, and influence over North Korea than any other country. History matters. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a historian. But history matters in general and, and, and in particular uh, with North Korea. There has been a remarkable degree of continuity uh, in, North, in the North Korean political system, in uh, the North Korean economic system, in, in, in um, North Korea's security concerns. Now, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that North Korea does not have or does not change or, or that there is stasis, but deep continuity. And because of this troubled 60-year history of the Sino-DPRK Sino alliance, there exists at the very root of the, of the alliance a profound sense of distrust toward Beijing. Now, there are two fundamental reasons for this. First, throughout the 60 years of the alliance, China has at times directly meddled in the internal or in the, the sovereign affairs of North Korea, and Pyongyang considers this a Chinese attempt to reaffirm its hegemony and make clear the hierarchy of, of, of nations in the region. Second, Kim Il-sung felt betrayed first by Mao Zedong uh, for improving relations with the United States without being uh, more supportive of Korea's uh, revolutionary priorities, um, and then later by the post-Mao leadership for turning away from class struggle and making uh, economic growth a top priority. Now, I'm going to examine each of these reasons in turn starting with China's intervention in uh, North Korean sovereign affairs. First, a little background. The Westphalian state system of, of, uh, based on sovereign equality was introduced to East Asia only at the end of the late 1990s or 1900s. For centuries, uh, I'm sorry, eight, the, the 19th century rather, the end of the uh, uh, 19th century, for centuries before that, um, until China was decentered following the 1894-1895 defeat in the Sino-Japanese War, a Sino-centric tributary system uh, served as the core organizing principle um, of Asian international politics. Joseon Korea was part of this Sino-centric state system, uh, which had its own sovereignty norms based on hierarchy and unequal status among states. Countries that were part of this system paid, paid tribute to China uh, in exchange for security and for the Middle Kingdom's favor. Now, the Korean term for this tributary relationship with China was Sade, which translates to serving the great. Now, if we look at the history of Sino-Korean relations, going back several centuries, for all this talk about Sade and serving the great and subservience to China, the Koreans never really believed it. If you really look carefully at the correspondence between, between Joseon and Qing governments, you'll see that the, the Chinese were, were often very frustrated with the Koreans because the Koreans never gave them the gratitude that they expected and, and never did what they were told and, and always acted as if they ran their own country. The Chinese might have been the only ones who really believed in this system uh, because it served their interests. Now, even if the leaders of Joseon Korea didn't really believe that, that Korea was, was subservient to China, the post-1945 leaders of North Korea did believe that the Sade relationship with China was the primary reason for Korea's, or for, uh, that, that Korea was unable to defend its, its sovereignty from Japan in 1910. Moreover, filtered through the lens of the Japanese colonial experience, the North Korean leadership detected lingering and varying degrees of, of uh, influence from this Sinocentric um, system uh, in its relations with the PRC after 1949. North Korea's Juche ideology, or, or, or self-reliance ideology, first articulated in 1955, is in its simplest form a rejection of Korea's subservient role in any, in any system, be it the sino tributary system or the international communist movement. Kim Il-sung was extremely hostile to all attempts by China and the Soviet Union to influence policy in the DPRK. Now, and China did, in fact, meddle in the sovereign affairs of North Korea on several occasions. Uh, first, during the Korean War. Uh, second, following the August plenum of the Korean Workers' Party Central Committee in 1956. Third, during the Cultural Revolution. And then again in, in, in uh, 1980, when the succession of Kim Jong-il was announced. I'm going to briefly describe each of these instances. 
Now, the first major sore spot, as you mentioned, was um, the Korean War. Uh, yet little is known of Kim Il-sung's frustrations with, with um, China during the war. Although the Chinese people's volunteers saved North Korea from certain defeat, uh, the North Korean leadership was not very happy with having in its midst a, a foreign military apparatus with control over field operations, as Bill Stook has, has suggested. There were also difficulties in uh, with, with the Chinese over control over uh, uh, Korean resources and, and, and facilities. Um, disputes uh, over, over the uh, control of North Korea's railroads were particularly severe. While the Koreans wanted to uh, begin focusing on economic uh, reconstruction, uh, once the battle lines had actually stabilized, um, the, the Chinese actually forbade any use of, of, of the railroads for anything other than um, transporting troops and, and, and supplies for military operations. All rail transport was paralyzed while the two sides uh, debated and struggled for control of the rail lines, and, and the stranded trains became easy targets for American bombers. Once it was decided that the, that the North Korean, or that a, a North Korean Bureau of Transportation would have control over the railroads, the Chinese then insisted that uh, uh, they be able to appoint their own deputies in this North Korean Bureau. There was also a fair amount of intrigue against Kim Il-sung uh, personally by the commander of, of the Chinese People's Volunteers, uh, Peng Dehui. Now, we've obtained a number of, of, of uh, Russian documents um, uh, from the archives, uh, uh, and, and, and many of them describe uh, this, this um, concern uh, over the, the post-Korean War uh, Sino-DPRK relationship. Um, according to many, many of these documents, Korean leaders made absolutely no attempt to maintain contact with the Chinese high command um, in North Korea. Their headquarters were just a short distance from Pyongyang. At the same time, Zhou Enlai was, was apparently so frustrated, uh, so disturbed by North Korea's ingratitude that he intentionally avoided North Korea's diplomatic functions in Beijing. Now, the Chinese People's Volunteers remained in North Korea until 1958, helping in post-war reconstruction by adding to the greatly reduced labor force. This, too, caused tensions in the alliance, however, uh, and bore a striking resemblance to earlier Han, Ming, and Qing occupations of the, Korean, or of the peninsula after providing military assistance to various Korean dynasties. Now, I doubt the, similar, this, the similarity when I noticed to Kim Il-sung. The presence of the Chinese People's Volunteers further increased the political influence of, of China in North Korea. Uh, also, the presence of, of tens of thousands of Chinese uh, soldiers in Korea and their increasing dependence uh, for food on local sources produced friction between, between them and the, and the Korean people. Now, the next um, incident, which um, occurred three years after the war, was perhaps one of the most blatant examples of, of China meddling in, in, in the internal affairs of, the, of, the, uh, of North Korea. Following a three-year debate inside the Korean Workers' Party, over um, post-war development strategies. Kim Il-sung purged a number of, of policy opponents at the August plenum of the Korean Workers' Party Central Committee. This was August 56. This is the so-called August factional incident, or the Pawa Jong Pa Sakon. All of these critics were either Soviet Koreans um, or cadres who had lived in China um, throughout the colonial period and became members of the, of the uh, CCP, or the Chinese Communist Party. Four of the purged critics fled to China, where they, were in, where they informed Mao Zedong of Kim Il-sung's actions. To investigate, Mao dispatched Peng Dehui, who was the commander of the Chinese People's Volunteers, and uh, the Soviet Union uh, dispatched uh, Khrush Nikita Khrushchev's tr um, troubleshooter, uh, Anastas Mikoyan. Um, so Peng and, and Mikoyan compelled Kim Il-sung to call another plenum in September and they directly meddled in internal Korean Worker Party affairs. They forced Kim Il-sung to rehabilitate his policy opponents and to reappoint them to their positions in the government and, and in the party. They forced him to publish a full record of, of uh, what had occurred at both plenar. They also compelled Kim to release individuals from prison, uh, allowing them to accompany Peng back to, to China. Now, this incident actually dominated political discourse in the Korean Workers' Party for the next three years, during which time Kim Il-sung took full advantage of the emerging Sino-Soviet split to eliminate uh, the influence of the Chinese Communist Party and the, and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union 
from the Korean Workers' Party through a series of purges. Now, Mao later apologized for the affair, and, and by the end of the night, or and by the early 1960s, um, relations with Beijing improved. Uh, this is because Pyongyang saw its its national interests falling more in line with those of, of, of Beijing than with, with, with uh, Moscow. Moscow at the time was encouraging peaceful coexistence with the United States, and this notion of, of, of peaceful coexistence was unconscionable to, to many Koreans and Chinese at, at the time who just, given the fact that just a decade before they, had, they were engaged in a bloody war with the United States over the survival of the DPRK. During the first few years of the 1960s, um, despite earlier frustrations, Beijing and, and Pyongyang were perhaps closer than at any point in the history of the alliance. Uh, yet, as archival documents reveal, by late 1964, the North Koreans were already taking measures to, to limit the influence of Beijing, fearing that, their, that Beijing's influence was, was growing at an alarming rate. Keep in mind, um, in the early 60s, uh, I think that the North Koreans were more anti, well, were very anti-Khrushchev um, uh, and uh, anti-Soviet, uh, as long as Khrushchev was in power. And um, so there wasn't a real counterbalance to the Chinese um, influence. Now, within a year, however, Sino-DPRK relations went or underwent a marked deterioration. Um, this this happened because of the outbreak of the Cultural Revolution in China. China once again attempted to manipulate the inner workings of the DPRK um, by encouraging the North Korean people to launch a cultural revolution of their own. Mao's Red Guards also labeled Kim Il-sung a fat revisionist for allegedly sitting on the fence in the Sino-Soviet split. They reported in Red Guard newspapers that Kim had been overthrown by pro-Chinese forces in a coup d'etat. The Chinese uh, also broadcast anti-DPRK propaganda through loudspeakers along the, uh, the, the border and set up slanderous displays in front of the Chinese embassy in, in, in Pyongyang. To resist these actions, the North Korean leadership passed a law banning displays in front of embassies. The Chinese embassy, however, refused to remove the displays, explaining that China would abide by the North Korean laws that they liked or that are liked and disregard all others. Red Guards went as far as to strap dead Koreans to the sides of trains crossing the border at Shinwiju with signs reading things like, this will happen to you next, you little revisionist. Beijing also cut shipments of goods and resources to North Korea despite pre-existing economic agreements. At the height of tensions, there were actually armed clashes along the, the shared border in the vicinity of Pekdu Mountain. By 1970s, relations began to improve slowly, uh, following Zhou Enlai's trip to, to Pyongyang, where the premier apologized for China's misdeeds. Official propaganda aside, however, the North Korean uh, leadership never completely forgave the, the PRC. In conversations with uh, other communist leaders over the, uh, the, in, in later decades, Kim Il-sung regularly re uh, criticized the Chinese, uh, referring to their actions um, during the Cultural Revolution. I'm going to return just in a, in a few moments to the 1970s. Um, I want to first describe uh, another perceived act of intervention in, in 1980. Um, now, North Korea once felt, or once again felt, that China was was being overly interventionist in, in 1980 by criticizing. Pyongyang's choice of Kim Jong-il as the successor to Kim Il-sung. Under the Sinocentric tributary system, um, it had been the privilege of, of Beijing to confer legitimacy on a Korean monarch. It came as a surprise to the North Korean leadership, however, that in 1980, Beijing still presumed it could voice an opinion on the leadership succession in, in Korea. At the Sixth Party uh, Congress in, in October 1980, Kim Jong-il was declared Kim Il-sung's successor. The move was condemned in Beijing. Articles were carried in Chinese newspapers criticizing the choice of the leader's son uh, to succeed the father. In the end, the Chinese leadership eventually came around and expressed their support for the leadership of Kim Jong-il. Nonetheless, one can only, only speculate about the bitterness engendered by Kim Jong-il towards the Chinese because of this criticism. Now, as I noted earlier, in addition to being uh, disturbed by China, um, China's overly interventionist policies, the North Korean leadership also felt 
betrayed when the PRC ignored North Korea's efforts to reunify the peninsula and its, and its attempts to improve relations, or in China's uh, attempts to improve relations with America. Um, then, after uh, the death of Mao, the Chinese Communist Party turned away from class struggle and made economic growth a top priority. As China improved relations with the United States following the 1971-72 Sino-US rapprochement, the PRC became less and less supportive of North Korea's use of military adventurism uh, to reunify the Korean Peninsula. Initially, um, Kim Il-sung thought there might actually be some benefits to this rapprochement with the US, um, or China's rapprochement with the US um, for North Korea and expressed support, something that a uh, few of, of China's allies um, did. I think Albania was, was one, of the, one notable exception. Zhou Enlai spoke with, uh, with Nixon about the Korean Peninsula um, and, and, and about um, Kim Il-sung's desire to, to see US troops withdrawn from South Korea. Now Kim had expected that through these negotiations um, between the US and China, China would be able to, to boot the United States out of the South. Uh, North Korea's initial support was very self-serving um, and Kim Il-sung um, tempered his enthusiasm for rapprochement once this did not happen. Now, following Mao's death in 1976, the <coughs> Chinese leadership increasingly placed its own economic pri uh, development interests above North Korea's revolutionary priorities. The greatest example, of course, is, is, is China's, or of China's rejection of the revolutionary state was Beijing's diplomatic recognition of Seoul in 1992. James, you have two more minutes. Okay. Not only was Beijing not supportive of Pyongyang's rev revolutionary priorities, the North Korean leadership placed more importance on their desire for economic development than on the DPRK's attempts to reunify the peninsula. Now, China today continues to, to um, place more importance on its, econ on, on its economic development and does not condone North Korea's military adventurism. The problem is, because of their troubled relations over the past 60 years, China has very little political leverage over North Korea today. With that as our, as our backdrop, let me say that although China might have been an unreliable ally to the DPRK, uh, China has not been um, a useless ally. In recent years especially, China has served as an important conduit for communication between major regional powers in the DPRK. It served as a political and, and diplomatic protector and an indispensable source of economic support. But we have to be very careful in looking at the relationship between China and, and North Korea. Um, we should not overemphasize the, the influence and leverage that, North, or that China has <coughs> over North Korea. At the same time, uh, and, and perhaps more importantly, we shouldn't underemphasize the degree to which North Korea fears and wants to do whatever is possible to avoid dependence on China. Now, I mean, it should be clear that China does not, because, because of this history, does not fully trust China. Um, yet, because Seoul and Washington have effectively severed contact with Pyongyang, we are forcing the DPRK begrudgingly into the arms of China. Moreover, we are pressuring uh, Beijing to do precisely what Pyongyang has, has most resented over the past 60 years, that is to, in, to influence North Korean politics. The Chinese leadership recognizes this. Uh, it's no longer actively trying to, or nor is it able to influence or meddle too much in, 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 in the policies of the DPRK. Instead, China is trying to do everything in its power to improve the tattered image, or improve its tattered image in North Korea. Uh, it's trying to improve its relations with, North Korea, with the North Korean leadership and to increase its limited influence in the DPRK, all at the expense of the US and South Korea. By relying on what we believe is, is China's influence and, and by refusing to deal directly with North Korea, the US is essentially empowering the PRC. This is something US has long sought to do and more importantly, I think it's something North Korea itself does not desire. Now, there have been a number of economic cooperation packages totaling some 200 million US dollars that, and then a number of exchanges uh, this past year between North Korea and, and, and China. But, there, but North Korea has shown little interest in becoming overly dependent on, on China. North Korea even continues to bristle at the idea of having a new bridge built across the Yalu, fearing that it would further integrate the North Korean economy into that of China and, and therefore increasing uh, dependence. North Korea seems willing to let China underwrite the regime as long as uh, no structural changes are required. Now, evidence of North Korea's reluctance uh, to become dependent on China can be, can be seen in many of North Korea's economic policies from last year, um, despite all these celebrations of, of, for the, of the Six-Year Alliance. 
The 2009 um, joint New Year's editorial called for the revival of the Cholima movement, a state-directed economic campaign launched in the 1950s to mobilize human and material resources just at the time when North Korea's allies were decreasing the amount of aid they were giving to Pyongyang. The original Cholima movement was designed to instill in the masses the idea of harmonious participation for the greater good of society and to force the Korean people to make do with the little that they had um, uh, because er, had available to them because of less aid coming from outside. The Cholima <coughs> movement was revived last year through the 150 day and then later 100 day um, battle um, uh, to boost the economy and, and both of these were reminiscent of, of, of campaigns launched in the late 1950s. So rather than become overly dependent on China and it seems the North Korean leadership would rather revive a mid 20th century social mobilization and state-directed development uh, strategy. Um, I'm going to yeah. cut it yeah. short here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, uh, James, for your presentation. Now, <laughs> now, I would like to invite uh, Professor Feng to Chu. make Chu. Professor Chu. Professor yeah. Chu <laughs> for making presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. It's my honor to be here and with all of you. I think that China's policy of North Korea has been always perceivably very controversial, and maybe a lot of uh, 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 speculations about why China continued to support the North Korea and reluctantly just uh, how say disconnect the China's assistance to North Korea as some sort of way say uh, uh, breathing tuber. We have way disconnect such a breathing tuber to North Korea, then North Korea will lay down, and also the denuclearization process also will allegedly speed it up. So a uh, lot of foul, uh, a lot of attack to the China's policy of North Korea. Um, but I think that James can be agreeable more about some sort of historical roots of China's approach to the North Korea. So I will give you some sort of a brief introduction of what are the matters behind the China's policy of North Korea, and how such a thing is working well to just, uh, you know, underscore the Beijing's consistency of policy of North Korea. First of all, just as the Jim very adequately, I think, pointed out, China's policy of North Korea is truly history matters. If we just recall our 2000 years long history between China and Korea. Every time the Korean Peninsula got into the KL or just get into some sort of very messy, it's always very dangerous because China also will be forcibly just engaged in. So what I just always link, lingering the Chinese mind is some sort of a very disastrous scenario of Korean Peninsula's some sort of domestic impulsion. So if you know the China's history with this Chinese Korean neighbor, every time just I point out the Korean Peninsula get in trouble, then China will forcibly just uh, step in. So such a historical impression truly now just uh, still very, very, uh, you know, notably impress most of Chinese. So we just uh, believe whatever just uh, happened to such a very troubled neighbor, but anyway, we don't want to see the Korean Peninsula or North Korea will just uh, how say slide into any form of such domestic impulsion or, 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 or some sort of domestic conflicts. So that's why basically we have a double concern to the North Korea. One is denuclearization, and the second is stability of North Korea. So that's why we always prefer to see some sort of, we say, incrementalist, you know, the change of North Korea. And also no matter how we dislike the North Korea. Um, yes, I think the GM also mentioned such an ideological affinity uh, of China to the Kim Il-sung's North Korea. Maybe such ideological affinity is because it's very important, you know, driver for Mao to decide to you know, intervene militarily by uh, dispatching China's volunteer troops 
are crossing the Yalu River and fighting the Americans' military nearly, you know, um, we say 60 years ago. But it seemed to me uh, the strong logic behind the Mao's, you know, such a military dispatching decision was some sort of the continuation of China's historical, you know, the engagement to the North Korea or to the Korean Peninsula. Just as I say, uh, every time the uh, Korean Peninsula just uh, how say become the messy, then China will forcibly engage. So Mao was not exceptional. Mao was also Chinese historical figure. So he's just uh, continued to use such a traditional, conventional Western of Chinese and the like to defend yourself by putting down some sort of imminent threat just uh, coming from the outside. So that's why such a thing as Korean Wars also is just a re-performing of such a traditional historical link between the China and the Korean, then such a mentality remain just linger, just I say, uh, most of the Chinese. But the problem is, a lot of people will say uh, China's such a historic rank probably also will make the Chinese take the North Korea as a buffer zone. I think such a assumption, or such a, such a assumption is totally gone or is totally irrelevant because when the Korean War fought, it was almost 60 years ago, so military technology could just, uh, you know, afford some sort of land attack centered, you know, such a war. But now if a war happened again, you can imagine U.S. will just uh, also have another ambitious, you know, the landing and uh, dispatch a lot of the, 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 the armies and just the uh, how say overtaking the north, such a thing totally is out of date. Now the U.S. war model is, we say, just uh, uh, much conducted by some sort of, we say, long distance attack or adequate attack. So for most of Chinese strategic designers, if the U.S. troops move up to the Yalu River, then what does it mean? It will become a very harmful to the Chinese security posture? Not at all. So because military technology not knowledge totally changed. So in the technological terms, there is no any, you know, the legitimacy for China to still occupy the North as some sort of buffer zone from Americans military presence in the in the in the in the, in the South Korea. So what are just the matters for China from the Korean War is that I can tell you the truth, some sort of Families of China's volunteer troops remain very, very sensitive to the North Korea's change. They believe their fathers, their mothers shed a lot of uh, blood in the, in, in the North Korea. So whatever we say the, 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 the Kim Jong-il is, no matter how bad he is, but they just uh, insist we can't lose the North Korea. Such a mentality is some sort of Chinese nostalgias. Then we can also say such a feeling is a very nationalistic. But I have to say such a feeling truly makes sense. So that's also part of the historical story we can figure it out from the Chinese thinking to the North. The second reason I think is the security ma matters. But what's the security? So it's a very non-traditional security. So if the North Koreans collapsed, let's say basically nearly two millions of North Korean refugees will falling into the Chinese side because there is no way but to just escape not to North. And the uh, three, eight pillows, you know, is just the five kilometers wide. It's very, very mining, horrible fields. So no North Korean refugee could fly over the DMZ. So the only way for them to exit is to running t towards the North, North. So then if we look at the China-North Korea borderline, do you know how long is it? It's uh, 1,350 kilometers. 
Then this border airline is not just the that long, but also very polous. It's a mountain area, it's bush areas, so it's very easy to just get back and forth. It's also a very, very horrible and a scary nightmare for most of Chinese because if a lot of uh, Korean refugees coming, then it will not just the house say cause a lot of a burden to just the settle them in, but also will just to cause a lot of such domestically, you know, ethnically, you know, the new social unrest in the northern part of China. Northern part of China, north, north, north eastern part of China, you know, traditionally called the Manchuria. It's always some sort of the concentration for different ethnic peoples. So in the modern history, the Manchuria is always some sort of very controversial place. So then the China's central government don't want to see the north uh, eastern part of China will just have a performing some sort of such historical, very bleak and dark side of the stories. Um, the third reason is perception matters. What's the China's perception? Um, I also did a research work, did a survey. I found a lot of Chinese, or majority of Chinese, nearly about 80% of the Chinese uh, respondents who dislike the North Korea, but they still say we should favor the North Korea for one reason. The reason is simple. It's, we say, the, the Americans' military presence and the regional preponderance in East Asia. Um, yes, China's possession of the United States always been very, very controversial, uh, even just co coherently, we say, contradictory. On the one hand, no country will be more important than the U.S. to beacon the China for a past, for a future. So I think the, the almost all Chinese know, so if there is a single power in the world who always inspire the Chinese so long and so much, it's always United States. But if you ask the Chinese, which country always makes them feel how say some sort of frustrated, it's always U.S. For example, the Taiwan Americans arms sale to Taiwan, now it's become some sort of potential, um, we say, explosive point. The reason is simple, because a lot of Chinese believe after the Obama administration came to power, China got become very much demanded. But U.S. did not just uh, compromise over such a China's key concern for example, just the uh, Taiwan's arms sale. Yes, you are guy will say Taiwan is democracy. America's commitment to the, 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 the Taiwan's democracy is totally moral. But the problem is they can be autonomously, you know, just to turn into some sort of persuasive rhetoric to the most of Chinese. They just uh, consider American's arms sale is the way to strategically just the uh, checking the China and rather than just a welcoming the China to, to just reemerge. So that's why the, China, the complexity of Chinese perception of the United States, I have to tell you, is most a defining factor for Chinese think of North Korea. Yes, they hate the Kim Jong-il. They dislike the North Korea. They also feel so China has the obligation to change the North Korea. But the problem is, no one will say we should just kill the North Korea by our hand, given the U.S. is still the uh, biggest strategic pressure to China. Yes, I see some sort of uh, indefinite link between the Chinese policy of North Korea to the China's perception of the United States. But the problem is some sort of, we say, complexity of U.S.-China relations always complicates the Chinese thinking and approach of North Korea. So we probably, consequentially, just uh, prefer to wait rather than just uh, always getting less lazy or more proac proactive, changing the North Korea's status. Um, the, the, the last point I want to share with you is what's the China's core of the approach of North Korea? Yes, you see a lot of 
China's you know, controversial aspect of the policy of North Korea. You also see some sort of usury with a very lazy you know, uh, dispension of the China's uh, uh, approach of the North Korea. But I have to say we also have some sort of very consistent call of our approach of the North Korea. In this call, a couple of elements also just uh, could be featured very, very explicitly. First is we prefer some sort of, just I say, gradualist and uh, incremental, you know, change of North Korea. We want, we say, the, the, the denuclearization. We also think the denuclearization sh shouldn't be just a house and negotiable. It's always there. We should achieve that without the all, you know, uh, uh, without any hesitation. But on the other hand, just the house that paralleling the China's concern of the denuclearization is the stability of North Korea in particular and the peace in Korean Peninsula in general. The second is Beijing now policy is also getting smarter. Yes, in the past years we see a lot of chances. China use the economic inducement to leverage some sort of the compromise but we think such uh, economic inducement will not just work well because it's every time when North Korea is trying to get some sort of economic games, they will superficially and uh, pretend to be you know, more cooperative. But very shortly after they just uh, get to the China's economic uh, such a, with a seduction, they will totally change their mind and also getting much tougher and also will eat their words and even just to break down the six-party talk. So now we will not use such economic leverage to seduce the North Korea back. So that's why I think the James Stenberg also made the point. So probably we need some sort of strategic patience. That's also some sort of commonly shared goal between U.S. and China. We will, we would like to leave them alone. We would like to just the house they always suffer from just the, you know, uh, growing international pressures until they make up the mind. No, you know, the, the strategic determination is a Chinese word. We believe the denuclearization is completely up to the North Korea's, you know, strategic determination. In Chinese words, it means zhan So. No such uh, dear leaders' uh, strategic determination. No breakthrough at all. So we also have to wait. But the problem is previously, we always were weighed by seducing the North. We believe they will be finally filled up. They will finally just uh, be very satisfied with such, we say, more friendly international surroundings. But we recognize it's all a mistake. North Korea is very desperate. It's always you know, conspiring to have a nuclear weapon while also just to become some sort of strong power. They're just trying to follow up with the China. You know, when the China exploded the first nuclear bombs at the middle of the 60s, we also got a lot of international opposition and actions. But we got through by using the self-reliance. Now, I think the dear leader just trying to duplicate the China's example. But the irony is that China is a big power, right? Then after the Mao, under the Mao's leadership, all the Chinese just uh, always just, uh, I'll say, uh, how to put it, just uh, got a very idealistic because we believe we're holy mission to fight against international purism. So even Cultural Revolution is a disaster. But the China's domestic cohesion was undoubtedly so much high. But look at today's North Korea. A lot of starvation, a growing some sort of way, say, the, 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 the dissensions and the dissatisfactions. The dear leaders looting, we say, the base also just getting cracking, getting shaky. So that's why I don't think that Kim Jong-il and his colleagues could be successfully just re the China's story of a self-reliance-based 
such a nuclear power-seeking strategy. If the North Korea would like to use the Chinese model, I think they also will be destined to fail. So now the current message is very complex, very mixed. North Korea just uh, come up with a good number of some sort of, we say, reform and open up policy in the past uh, two months. They declared now they set up, you know, development banks. They also would like to just uh, have uh, establish the special economic zones. They also encourage their carries just uh, going abroad and uh, learning how to run in such a market economy. So for China, hope is coming. The chances also just uh, has been never been so bigger for Beijing to affirm the North Korea in a way we say making them follow up with the China's case. So that's why my last point that if we would like to achieve the denuclearization, just to squeeze the North Korea on two fronts. One is we should always stick into the denuclearization, verifiable, irreversible, comprehensive. They are all the key notes, key words. No one would like to just, uh, how say, abandon, or no one want to just uh, deal with the North Korea without such uh, key words. On the other hand, we also have to push the North Korea in all the way, in the ways we can, just to make it even just, uh, how say, moving very slowly, but very firmly. If we can just open the bridge, make the country just gradually, how say, open, I think the, 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 the fate for Kim Jong-il is, is, we say, regime transformation. It's also some sort of probably peaceful regime change. I believe as long as North Korea decide to open that, then the days of the Kim Jong-il's will be truly counted. Then if the Kim Jong-il could just uh, pass away, or it's if the, the regime transformation could be very expectable, I think that will be very credible, you know, the, the, the possibility for us to force the North Korea to give up all its nuclear weapon. Otherwise, I don't think North Korea will make up their strategic determination and uh, truly just, uh, uh, you know, abandon their nuclear weapon in exchange of a package of deal. So that's why at the core of Chinese approach, just as I say, it's very clear cut. We're always just trying to squeeze in on two fronts. Open up the North Korea, and in the meantime, just uh, how say, undercut all the, 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 the possibility for the dear leader to manipulate the power relations. Make them no place to play out. Then they will recognize such uh, international pressures and uh, we say uh, 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 scrambling, you know, the, 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 the international, you know, the isolation will deprive the all the chance for North Korea to survive with nuclear weapon. Let me stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chu. Now I would like to call upon uh, Professor Sutter. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, talk about uh, China and North Korea. Um, I'm very grateful to James for inviting me uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I've written a short paper. Uh, it's available and when you Google my name. Uh, you, you get my email at the Georgetown website, and uh, I'll be happy to send you the paper. Uh, and I don't plan to spend a lot of time uh, uh, going through the details of the paper because what I've done is looked at the patterns of Chinese interaction with North Korea uh, over the, in the post-Cold War period. Uh, so this is about a 20-year period. And uh, what can we learn from uh, this kind of interaction? And uh, what are the patterns that one sees here? And I'm just looking at the actions of what the Chinese have done and so forth. And, I, and what I find, um, this is a tentative uh, set of conclusions, of course, uh, but I find that uh, it's very consistent with the broad trends of Chinese foreign relations in this period. 
Uh, and uh, uh, unlike the uh, legacy that James alluded to that China has in the past in dealing not just with North Korea, but with just about every uh, country around its periphery, a very sort of n a very negative legacy that China has. Uh, uh, James was referring to the Cultural Revolution and the things that happened uh, with North Korea. Well, you could just go around the rim of China. It happened everywhere. And so, uh, but it's not like that now. It's much more consistent. Uh, the approach is, uh, is much more reasoned, much more careful. Uh, it's cautious, it's wary, uh, and it's heavily reactive. Uh, the Chinese uh, are not in control of this situation, and, uh, and they have to adjust uh, all the time. So what you find is that basically it's consistent with what I see as China's rise in Asia. It's a very encumbered rise. Uh, China's, uh, uh, Professor Ju talked about the role of the United States, how we're complicating everything in, in the region. Yeah, we, for China's perspective, we do complicate, the United States does complicate things. And so this is, this is true. And, uh, and China has lots of complications around the rim, and North Korea is a big one. And, uh, and so it's, my basic point is that China's really not in a position to be very assertive. Uh, it really doesn't want to take big risks. And, uh, or the things that could be costly in dealing with North Korea or any other way. And so what you find is that they, they tend to err on the side, they tend to uh, decide on the side of caution. Uh, and now uh, I know this is a very uh, uh, knowledgeable audience and I'm sitting next to Sam Kim who I've admired for, for decades on, on these kinds of issues and the panel is full of experts and experts in the audience. So I'm got, and normally I wouldn't read, uh, but I have an overview, which I think I will read from the paper. Uh, but I want to leave time for the audience so I, I, I can shorten it. And I, but basically, the, 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 this is a wind-up, and the conclusion is five findings at the end, which I will tick off at the end So uh, as we go along. So let's just uh, take a look at the, uh, at the overview. Uh, and it's basically this. The, the Chinese administration has experienced major twists and turns in its relations with North Korea since the end of the Cold War. The record shows China repeatedly put in a reactive position as it was compelled to deal with crises call, caused by North Korea's nuclear weapons development, often abrupt and wide swings in North Korea's posture toward its neighbors and the United States, and economic collapse and leadership transition in Pyongyang. U.S. policy toward North Korea and that of South Korea also have been erratic in this 20-year period. The stakes for China have been high. With the possible exception of Taiwan, there is no more important area around China's periphery for Chinese domestic and foreign policy interests than the Korean Peninsula. The stakes grew with the rising Chinese equities in improving relations with South Korea in the post-Cold War period. And they grew with the often intense U.S. and other regional and international involvement to curb North Korea's advancing nuclear weapons development. A good deal has been written recently about China's growing frustration with North Korea following its nuclear weapons test in 2006 and in 2009 and other provocations. Contrary to past practice, the Chinese administration has allowed a public debate recently where relations with North Korea often are depicted as a liability for China, requiring serious readjustment in Chinese policy. Meanwhile, some American commentators suspect that China, in order to weaken U.S. power and influence in Northeast Asia, is somehow manipulating the North Korean brinksmanship and avoiding using its influence in conjunction with the United States in order to get North Korea to reverse its nuclear weapons development. Now, the evidence of growing Chinese frustration with North Korea is strong. While the evidence to support the charge of a self-serving Chinese manipulation of North Korean nuclear crisis is much less strong. On balance, the overall record of Chinese policy shows continuing caution. China endeavors to preserve core Chinese interest in stability on the Korean Peninsula through judicious moves that strike an appropriate balance among varied Chinese relations with concerned parties at home and abroad. China remains wary that North Korea, the United States, and others could shift course, forcing further Chinese adjustments in response. Chinese leaders recognize that their cautious policies have failed to halt North Korea's nuclear weapons development. They probably judge that they will be living with a nuclear North Korea for some time to come. 
even as they emphasize continued diplomatic efforts to reverse North Korea's nuclear weapons development and create a nuclear-free peninsula. They appear resigned to joining the United States and other leaders in what is characterized by some authors as failure management as far as North Korean nuclear weapons development is concerned. They will endeavor to preserve stability and Chinese equities with concerned powers. As in the recent past, they probably will avoid pressure or other risky initiatives on their own, waiting for the actions of others or changed circumstances that would increase the prospects of curbing North Korea's nuclear challenge and allow for stronger Chinese measures to deal with nuclear North Korea. Now, when you look at the 20-year period of, uh, of uh, China's interaction with North Korea, we need to remember that there have been big swings in this period. And I divided the period up to th in three basic sections. Uh, the first uh, was the first 10 years after the Cold War, uh, in 1989 to 2000. And this featured Chinese anxiety over North Korean leadership transition and instability and economic collapse in North Korea and anxiety over the crisis with the United States prompted by North Korea's nuclear weapons development. But then we have this interlude of 2000 and 2001, which featured a period of unprecedented detente on the Korean Peninsula, where China facilitated North Korean outreach and endeavored to keep pace with the expanding North Korean contacts with South Korea, the United States, Russia, and others. But then the situation reversed to a tense, uh, tense one, beginning in 2002 and up to the present, which featured periodic and intense North Korean provocations and wide swings in U.S. policy, ranging from thinly disguised efforts to force regime change in North Korea to close collaboration with Pyongyang negotiators. South Korean policy also shifted markedly from a soft to a harder line in dealing with North Korea. So you see that China has to adjust to a lot of changes uh, in, their, in, in their effort to sustain a stable situation on the peninsula. Overall, China's frustration with the North Korea's continued development of nuclear weapons and other provocative actions grew. Chinese uh, officials obviously miscalculated when they argued in the past that North Korea's nuclear weapons program was not a serious one. Uh, and so China's working assumption recently seems a more realistic one. North Korea is intent on keeping nu nuclear weapons. In response, China was more willing yet with continued reservations to join U.S.-backed efforts uh, in the United Nations to criticize and impose limited sanction on North Korea until it resumes negotiations. And so what you find is basically a modest hardening of China's stance toward North Korea, but complementing this are a series of very positive steps that, uh, toward uh, North Korea. The mix of Chinese actions, it's hard to measure for me to measure these, but it seems involved, it involves more carrots than sticks uh, in order to deal with North Korea. And so, uh, and this is, uh, this, is, this is a very safe approach. It's an approach uh, China seeks to avoid negative outcomes on the Korean Peninsula. It's a very uh, volatile area. And so this, in conclusion, what I come up with are five basic uh, points that I would make. Number one, China has been and continues to be reactive in dealing with changing circumstances affecting its interest on the Korean Peninsula. Number two, China's focus has been to preserve stability in an uncertain environment caused by internal pressures and international provocations of North Korea and erratic policies by the United States and South Korea. Number three, China miscalculated North Korea's attentions regarding nuclear weapons. Its frustrations with North Korean actions in this area recently has led to some hardening of China's position. However, China generally eschews pressure and stresses diplomacy in order to manage the failure to stop North Korea's nuclear weapons development and to maintain the opportunity to pursue meaningful denuclearization under changed circumstances in the future. Four, China continues to follow practices that employ positive incentives rather than pressure in order to elicit North Korean willingness to avoid further provocation and to return to negotiations on eventual denuclearization. And fifth, China seeks to sustain a position as the power with the best relations with both North and South Korea as a means to, to ensure that its interest in the potentially volatile peninsula will be sustained. 
Now, these are basic conclusions. I think they're not surprising to a lot of the experts in the audience, uh, but this is what I have found in my review of this period, and I find it very consistent with the overall thrust of Chinese foreign relations throughout the region and in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Kim, it is your turn. My assigned topic is uh, North Korea's perception of China or uh, PRC, DPRK, uh, Security Pact of 1961. Uh, if I have to write, I don't have written paper like <laughs> Bob <laughs> Sutter, but this is how I would organize my paper. Uh, starting with some broad generalization, and then uh, uh, talk something about the uh, uh, alliance drawing from IR theoretical literature, and then move on to uh, how historian would view DPRK's alliance thinking and behavior. Yeah. And then move on to North Korea's alliance behavior, thinking and behavior during the uh, Cold War period. And then the last section will be uh, North Korea's alliance thinking and behavior in the post-Cold War era. Now, I could not resist the temptation of making uh, broad generalization about uh, North Korea's uh, perception of China or PRC DPK alliance. Uh, that uh, you'll have to take what I have to say with large grain of salt a la Walter Mondale, former president, uh, Vice President Walter Mondale, who said, as I recall, anybody who claims to be an expert on North Korea is either liar or fool. <laughs> so I trust and hope that uh, some will not uh, stand up yelling, you lie <laughs> or you fool. <laughs> that having said, my one sentence answer to North Korea's perception of China or DP, uh, PRC DPRK alliance is uh, to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill's <coughs> uh, definition of democracy that it's the worst alliance except. There is nothing better to replace it. <laughs> For better or worse, DPRK is the only country with which PRC, quote, in quotation, maintain, whether in name or in practice, a Cold War security pact. Or you can reverse that statement, saying, for better or worse, China is the only country with which North Korea maintain, whether in name or in practice, a Cold War security pact. Without doubt, China holds greater importance in North Korea's foreign policy China. than <coughs> DPRK or North Korea holds in Chinese foreign policy. China's potential trump card in Korean affair are legion, including demographic weight as world's most populous country, territorial size and contiguity, military power as world's third largest nuclear weapon state, veto power in UN Security Council, and most recently and importantly, economic power as newly rising economic superpower. 
as made evident in the fact that uh, China ho is, uh, uh, has world's largest uh, uh, holder of foreign exchange reserve, uh, surging head of Japan several years ago, I think something like uh, two trillion dollars. And uh, ch in 2009, China surged head of Germany as world's largest export power. And China is poised to surge head of Japan as world's second largest economy. Not on PPC basis. That China did in 19. 91 or 1992, but in conventional GDP basis, uh, if uh, this revised uh, statistic for China's 2009 economic growth is true, if not at the end of 2009, certainly uh, yeah, sometime in uh, 2010. Now, whether viewed and analyzed theoretically or historically, there persists abiding tension between Juche, which is the uh, ideological normative foundation of uh, China's, uh, North Korea's uh, foreign policy, and alliance. Let me tell you why this uh, tension persists. Alliance, uh, is a mean of external balancing alongside internal balancing through aggregation of arms buildup and now defunct territorial aggrang aggrandizement. Alliances are one of the three major means of enhancing power or security. So alliance, therefore, is a mean, not an end. And when alliances dissolve, this is likely the result of changes in state's identity, which leads to a shift in that state's strategy for power enhancement, in the nature of external threat, or in the perception of allied commitment and credibility, or in national interest and strategic preferences. Now, one problem with North Korean's uh, alliance thinking and behavior has to do with the momentous change in the international system, say from uh, 1989 to 1992, uh, which has drastically changed the conditions and context under which DPRK will have sick uh, define and seek uh, uh, its, uh, its uh, alliance uh, uh, behavior. Uh, historically speaking, there is also abiding tension between Juche, which again is, uh, is the form of internal balancing, and what has been referred by one of the early speakers, Sade Jui. Uh, expression Shade Jui is verboten in North Korea, but the South Koreans uh, constantly talk about Sade Jui. It's, uh, it's translated literally as serving the great, meaning that uh, it's, uh, it's you know, uh, uh, expression of uh, traditional uh, Korean thinking about uh, China. And uh, here I uh, will ha have to uh, 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 quote uh, this uh, wonderful statement from Carter Eckert's uh, Korean history book, uh, where the, uh, that really captures the essence of this uh, traditional Sade Jui. It just disappeared. Sorry about this, because I, I want to make exact quotation. Yeah, I'm quoting here, to exist outside the realm of Chinese culture was, for the Korean elite, 
to live as barbarian. <laughs> That's, I think, is uh, uh, the captured essence of Tade Jui. And uh, uh, in my opinion, Tade Jui is not used in no North Korea. And North Korea translated Tade Jui as uh, flunkism. If you look up any dictionary, there's no word flunkism. But that's North Korea's uh, thinking about uh, 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 traditional uh, Korea. And this thinking really comes alive when uh, one, one of the high-ranking North Korean official uh, made this statement to a visiting U.S. delegation in August 2003. And I think it, it really highlights uh, uh, that uh, there is that abiding tension between uh, Zhu Che and historical legacy of Sade Jui. I'm quoting here, the basic strategic fact for us is rooted in, ch in history. We have been victimized by all our neighbors from Qing times on. This is why we want closer relations with the United States. For over a century, the countries around us have competed to control us for their own strategic security and economic reason, and we became a better, their, uh, their battleground. We must look at the strate strategic picture, the big picture, as we have, as we have to, in order to survive. Um, my uh, thinking is that the, uh, the shortest slash longest pathway to North, North Korean security goes through Washington. And here what this high-ranking North Korean official is saying to uh, visiting U.S. delegation August 2003, please, please do your best to make this pathway shorter and shorter to North Korean security. That is shorter and shorter uh, pathway to uh, North Korean security running through Washington. Now, alliance behavior, North Korea's alliance, alliance be behavior during the Cold War uh, can be uh, captured in the uh, ineluctable fact that the newly established PRC almost single-handedly rescued Kim Il-sung's regime from extinction, but at inordinate material, human, and political costs. In addition to over 750,000 casualties, including Mao's own son, China missed the opportunity to liberate Taiwan, was excluded from the United Nations for more than two decades, and lost some 20 years in its modernization drive. Nonetheless, during the Cold War, Chinese leader reiterated the immutability of the militant friendship with North Korea. Premier John Lai and PLA Army uh, Marshal Zhu De used the metaphor of organic closeness of, quote, lips and teeth to describe the strategic importance of Korea to China as a public <coughs> state against external power. The militant revolutionary alliance sealed in blood, Xiemeng, during the uh, Korean War, formalized, as formalized in, 19, in the 1961 uh, uh, Alliance Treaty, sustained one Korea or pro-Pyongyang policy for more than three decades. Long shadow of Korean War thus assured the continuity of this militant friendship between China and North Korea at the level of policy pronouncement, or at least until the late 1970s. With the rise of Sino-Soviet dispute in the late 1950s, and the eruption of open conflict in the 1960s, Kim Il-sung opted for strategies of making virtue out of necessity by manipulating his country's relationship 
relationship with Moscow and Beijing in a self-serving way. He took sides when necessary on particular issues, always yep. attempting to extract the maximum payoffs in economic, technical, and military assistance, but never completely casting his lot with one over the other. However, growing sense of socialist betrayal, abandonment, abandonment, abandonment fear, and urgency of security, securing self-relying and existential uh, deterrence was accentuated by sudden loss of Soviet nuclear umbrella. When Kremlin announced in September 1990 that you normalize relations so DPRK said in a prophetic memo that Moscow saw normalization would mean an end to the DPRK USSR alliance and that Pyongyang would have no other choice but to take measures to to provide for ourselves some weapons for which we have so far relied on the alliance. Newly declassified document from the archive of Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, especially the strikingly candid and unvarnished transcript of secret conversation between Kim Il-sung and his uh, his uh, senior advisors and their s uh, counterpart in the former socialist war from 1950 and to the 1980 throw much of Kim Il-sung's mindset regarding nuclear weapon in a sharp leaf. I don't want to you know, ma make all the important points that I discover uh, in this uh, uh, document, but one point uh, is worth noting, that such effort, such efforts for uh, having uh, self-reliant uh, nuclear deterrence has been driven by deep-seated twin fears of renewed U.S. military attack and allied abandonment by Moscow and Beijing. In the post-Cold War era, especially in the wake of Beijing's Seoul normalization in 1992, China has somewhat distanced itself from DPRK, although without, with a conscious desire to avoid committing Soviet fallacy of premature allied abandonment. Beijing is caught between the belief that 1961 treaty is unusable Cold War relic and the notion that it is still a symbol of special relations, socialist relationship between China and North Korea. Although the present day Sino DPRK relationship is certainly not as close as it once was, neither Beijing nor Pyongyang has shown any interest in formally modifying the treaty. Unlike the 1961 Soviet DPRK treaty, mm. Sino-DPRK treaty cannot be revised or abrogated without prior mutual agreement, Article 7. During Jiang Zemin's state visit to Seoul in 1995, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman stated the alliance does not commit Chinese troops to defending North Korea. On other occasions, formulation has been that Beijing's support would not be provided if North Korea, quote, launched, quote, unprovocative attack, end of quotation, and that treaty does not require the dispatch of Chinese military forces, or China was not willing to intervene, quote, automatically, unquote. With such seeming impunity, Beijing projects strategic posture of calculated ambiguity, letting it be known to all that treaty commitment to Pyongyang could be interpreted as Chinese leader choose, okay, or it does not consider treaty ipso facto hard and fast uh, uh, commitment. 
faced with such asymmetrical interdependence reality on the ground, Beijing seek to achieve multiple and mutually competing goals on multiple fronts. Bruntly put, Chinese foreign policy wish list with respect to North Korea includes at least five no's. No instability, no collapse, no nukes, no refugees or defectors, and no conflict escalation. On the other hand, for DPRK, the most challenging, uh, daunting challenge is how to survive by seeking more and more aid as external life support without triggering system collapse. Uh, by way of conclusion, I would say that paradoxically, Pyongyang's growing dependence on Beijing for its economic and political survival has served as a sure recipe for mutual distrust and resentment. Just as Mao demanded and resented Soviet aid for China's nuclear development, Kim Il-sung and now Kim Jong-il have demanded and resented Chinese aid. Indeed, Pyongyang's fundamentalism and seeming inability to adjust or to refurbish its national identity to and role to changing reality has endangered intense behind the scene bargaining amidst an atmosphere of mutual trust. Pyongyang has taken a sleight of hand approach, privately asking for more and more aid, even as North Korean diplomats habitually deny that they have ever asked for or received uh, Chinese aid. Let me by way of concluding, uh, uh, say a few words about my close encounter with the high-ranking North Korean diplomat. Uh, I even remember the day, May 26, 1998, involving two high-ranking North Korean uh, diplomats, Ambassador Lee Hong Chul and Ambassador Lee Gun, who later became the uh, North Korea's uh, chief uh, uh, negotiator at Six Party Talk, and a dozen of uh, U.S. scholar and government official, including uh, yours truly. And uh, the all-day session, closed uh, session, was devoted to North Koreans making a plea and argument to lift or reduce U.S. sanction. At one point, the one of the uh, participants, I think Jerry Cohen, said, well, uh, we uh, you know, agree, but uh, suppose the United States uh, uh, removed the sanction, uh, do you think that any American the multinational corporation rushed to Beijing? Uh, to his uh, ambassador, uh, Lee Hyung Chil responded, no, 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 that's not what you expect. But it give a powerful signal to other countries who want to move to North Korea for investment. Uh, that I thought was an extremely interesting uh, uh, insight I gained. And another one is that when somebody said, I think with John Merrill uh, of State Department, what about all the aid you get from China? At which point, ambassador uh, Ri Yang Chiu was so upset, he stood up and saying, what Chinese aid? We're not getting any Chinese aid. In fact, if we ask Chinese aid, say a million tons of grain, it'll be given next day, but at unacceptable price. And again, they're in the behind the scene discussion <coughs> with American counterparts, uh, they really play down the notion that uh, that uh, China has become North Korea's you know, uh, life support system. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, I'm afraid to say that we are running uh, behind time somewhat, but we are going to have 15 minutes uh, Q&A. Please make your questions uh, brief and simple. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the four interesting presentations. My conclusion is there's nothing to be gained by for the United States to
to expect Beijing to provide significant leadership in resolving the nuclear issue. Would you agree or disagree? Professor Chu. Let me just respond. Uh, based on what happened between uh, August 2003, when six party talk got underway, and late 2007, what has really worked moving uh, the six party talk off its death center is careful combination of bilateral and multilateral talk. Every one of the three significant breakthrough, I'm talking about uh, September 19, 2005 joint statement, and the February uh, uh, implementation agreement and November implementation agreement was all catalyzed by behind the scene direct bilateral negotiation between the United States and North Korea. And it was adopted, endorsed by the remaining four parties. So, so I don't want to underplay, overplay the role of the United States, but the combination of uh, bilateral and multilateral discussion. In fact, this is the latest uh, 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 gesture from North Korea that uh, uh, they want to return uh, to the six-party talk, but uh, this is contingent on having bilateral talk within the framework of six-party uh, uh, process, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Thank you. Uh, let me receive several questions together and then uh, let the panelists uh, answer uh, your question. Um, yes. Uh, Herbert Levin, I'd like to thank Professor Sutter for his uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, review of how China's policy towards North Korea is consistent with uh, China's overall foreign policy. But the period he covered, uh, China was relatively uh, weak. They uh, lacked many of the resources. Uh, Today they're rather, rather strong, not just the trillions of dollars, but trained people and so forth. Uh, w uh, do you expect the Chinese to continue to be reactive, or do you think with all of their uh, resources and not lacking pride that they may move out and uh, take more initiatives and drawing on your l great background, uh, what initiatives do you anticipate? Okay, two more questions, sir. By depending on China to influence North Korea, U.S., the United States is empowering North Korea. Is that? Empowering China. I'm, uh, oh, empowering China. Okay. Well, okay. E even if that's so, it seems to me that, that one of the things the United States wants to avoid is a resumption of the Cold War situation where North Korea could essentially play off China and the Soviet Union, thereby getting a lot from both. As long as... Uh, they don't have a second power to play off China to get aid, then they are, for the long term, not in a really good situation. Okay? Would you, would you agree with that? Or, um, so that, that would be kind of, I mean, you, you have to think about both China and North Korea and kind of balance the two in terms of who we're trying to influence. Yes, one more question, gentlemen. Yes, uh, name is David Onsberg. I have a question about uh, the uh, when the uh, the for the well, I've understood to be the uh, re uh, forcible repatriation of those fleeing North Korea into China uh, back into North Korea. And the question I have is number one: is that is that policy still continuing? And number two: are there plans to change that policy? And number three: if that policy is continuing, why is that keep on uh, continuing? You know, I'm, I'm talking about those who flee persecu uh, persecution in North Korea going to safe haven countries uh, uh, th through uh, China to Mongolia or to Thailand 
uh, and and uh, and why why they are being uh, forcibly returned back to North Korea, where they could f f uh, face certain torture, imprisonment, death, enslavement, that kind of thing. Can they not be allowed to go to a, uh, to a, to a haven country that will accept them, such as Mongolia or South Korea, that kind of <coughs> thing? Thank you. So now, Professor Chu, uh, Professor Sutter, to be followed by James. Please. Okay, uh, just one point I want to just raise. Uh, I think uh, as for the China's, we say the low expect, that has been always very moderate. If you just read the China's official statement, Beijing always dramatically just to have, say, limit ourselves or restrain ourselves as some sort of mediator. I can tell you, so I'm a totally disagree. I think the China is key part by all the, the, the means. But the problem is, it's also some sort of a historical loose. You know, the first uh, nuclear uh, crisis in the Korean Peninsula, then the China's official stance to this crisis was very, 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 how to say, bizarre, because we believe it's now for the business. The second time, second crisis coming, we changed. Then we say we're mediated. So yeah, it's uh, some sort of historically proceeding. But the problem is, when the China just uh, has uh, trying to just uh, keep our uh, low expect, always just uh, as lower as just I say, it's some sort of mediator. It's not uh, just uh, has a bigger pusher or bigger, you know, how say uh, a game maker or something like that. Beijing don't want to just uh, how say offer a great diplomatic actis activism to, for example, just uh, how say cutting off the old age or just uh, um, change the status quo in North Korea by the hand. So it's some sort of diplomatic shooting. And uh, behind that, the Beijing is just a uh, fail. They can just uh, have some sort of safe. But anyway, I think in the coming days, I mean, if the six-party talk will resume, then Beijing also will play the key role. But the problem is, first of all, what sort of the consensus could just build up between the Washington, Beijing, Seoul, Tokyo, and Moscow? The second is, um, what's the domestic dynamic will be emerging in the North Korea? So I think that no one can uh, deny the factor. So if the Kim jong Yo passed away this evening, no one will be surprised. But the problem is why we'll be following up. So we need uh, some sort of a corroborative effort. So now it seemed to me that the Beijing prefer to keep the low, you know, the, 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 the low expect, but reality now is just moving in some sort of the opposite. Let me stop here. Thank you, Professor Sutter. Uh, thanks to, to Mr. Levin's uh, question. Um, I think the, I view China still as uh, encumbered and uh, really, uh, Taking off from Professor Chu's remarks, uh, China is still shows itself in Asia as as encumbered in a lot of different ways, and therefore not it's powerful. It's more powerful, but it's not in a position really to assert itself for a variety of different reasons. And what I'm watching, and I think Korea would be the place where this would happen. Where will China undertake risks, costs, and commitments that they don't have to undertake? And they just don't do this. Uh, uh, and so, you know, for example, in the Korean Peninsula, in the in the first in this decade, the Chinese were very dissatisfied with George W. Bush's policy for many years. They thought it was the wrong policy, and the South Koreans agreed with the Chinese. It was a, this area is so important for China, and I I would have thought this is the time for China to say, no, don't do what the Americans want, do what China wants. They don't do that. They would because if it fails it would be China's responsibility. And I think they're just not ready to do that. I'm watching, I'm waiting for when that will happen, and uh, I, I'm, I've got my antennas out, but they don't do it. This is not a great power in that sense. It's not a leader. And so, uh, so this is something that, that I think we just need to watch, and they're very more, they're powerful and so forth. And just on, the, on Paul Chamberlain's, uh, I'd like to just weigh in a little bit on that. Should the U.S. rely on China for the North Korean talks? When you look at the record, as I did, I guess I have to see we're into failure management. And obviously you have to work together in failure management. 
But the thing that makes me cautious and very tentative about this is that people that work this issue in the U.S. government are just like Mr. Detrani. They say China is very important. We've got to have China. And you hear this all the time. And so I don't know. I'm not the negotiator. So I'm very, def I'm very definite about this. I'm saying there's probably something to that. And so, but I don't know what it is exactly, except that they always say it. And so, so I, I uh, you know, and so are they just being nice to China? Or are they saying, well, we want to bring, the, but it's, it's a very, so I'm confused on this issue. I think the record underscores your point, uh, but that's, but the U.S. negotiators always say this. And so I say, I'm going to wait. I'm not sure. Thank you. James? Well, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Professor Kim said earlier. The road to, uh, the shortest road to denuclearization runs through um, Washington. And, and I think that the North Koreans have been telling us for, telling us this uh, for, for some time and we haven't necessarily been, been listening. I don't, I don't think that they're trying to, to, the North Koreans are coming to us or coming to the United States and at the same time going to China to, to, to have that, that balance. I, I think they would really prefer to work with the United States. The United States is perceived as a much more predictable foe than China has been a, a, a reliable or predictable ally over the course of these 60 years. Um, and uh, they would like to, I think, just establish some, some uh, uh, parameters for a relationship with the United States and move beyond the, um, the, that Cold War um, uh, uh, binary of sorts. I mean, it's they, they're ready to, I think they, they would prefer just to work with the United States and, and resolve this once and for all. Uh, thank you. I think we can entertain uh, two more questions before winding up. Uh, back uh, there, gentlemen. Yes, over there. Yeah. Uh, Tony Kuo from Stimson Center. My question is to uh, Dr. Zhu. Uh, it seems to uh, indicate that uh, China has been mistreated and misunderstood by the world. Uh, it's all because of the United States. And uh, you just used the examples of North Korea and arms sales to Taiwan. And I would like to uh, uh, ask your opinion. How, uh, you, how do you see the uh, uh, China's government refuse Taiwan's request to remove the missiles uh, toward Taiwan? Uh, do, do you think that would be, uh, if you're the China's government say yes to this, to Taiwan, do you think that's a great opportunity for China to improve its image? to prevent him from mistreating again by the, by the word. Yeah, thank you. thank you. One more question from, yes, yes, sir. Well, this is Yang Rui. I'm a former World Bank economist. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Feng that I agree completely with you that uh, the North Korea denuclearization will not happen unless North Korea is convinced that opening up is the benefit for their economy so that uh, they can go to global market and global economic integration. Now, in that context, uh, I would like to ask you how much Chinese academicians really discussed uh, the North Korea's benefit in global market integration to do that the kind of economic reform China and the Vietnam went through. Now, the, of course, at the official level, you know, as you said, that historically North Korea hate the Chinese, uh, lecturing them, et cetera. But, you know, at the private level, I was told that North Korean market was flooded by Chinese commodity. 90% of consumables are Chinese made. So there are a lot of act active private interaction through, you know, border trade and the small scale traders or smuggling, whatever. Then what about Chinese academicians do some kind of a forum with the North Korean academicians? Ever happened or never attempted or uh, could you answer that question? Professor Chu. Yeah. I think the North Korean and China maintain a variety uh, of, you know, the contacts, so such a particularly social and a political, you know, la, 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 la penetration has been also more than other, you know, bilateral contacts. Um, 
So it's also offer like China uh, uh, ways are very good, you know, the access to North Korea and also just uh, uh, leave the Beijing a good leverage to influence the North Korea. But the problem is the country has been very, very, you know, bizarre. So then I also got involved uh, different, you know, official and non-official occasions to talk with the North Korean compass, say, what they impress me they, is that they always super smart. They really know how to talk the things with the different compots. They always just trying to just uh, how say uh, seek the courtship to the American compot. They also don't want to just uh, how say uh, enrage the Chinese. They always learn how to skillfully. Just uh, how say uh, make the South Korean counterpart feel cozy. That's why I see a lot of such, let's say, very tactical, picky, you know, the 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 subject of setting you know North Korea's handling to the outside. So that's why I also have to say, if we want to understand what is truly in their mind, we also have to look around, and also examine their basic approach on how to just uh, tackle the outside world. Um, your question is, uh, if the North Korea decide to open up, I think it's truly serve the China's interests because we be believe so it's the only reliable way to secure the country and also make the country survive. Otherwise, sooner or later, DPRK will disappear. I think no one uh, will doubt that. So. That's why I think that for us, we also have some sort of uh, readiness for both options. As long as North Korea just uh, refuse to uh, reform, our ban reform the open net, then it's a domestic impulsion, impulsion will come in sooner or later. Then if they just uh, follow up with the Vina and the China, maybe uh, also just uh, leave the country with some sort of a glimpse of the help for survival. So that's why I think the China approach of North Korea just says that is characterized we want to squeeze on the two fronts. But the problem is even if the North Korea reform open that, then it will secure its long lasting survival. That question should just uh, how say addressed for the South Korean friends. But my view is that Judging from the China's experience, experience, as long as North Korea decide to open up sooner or later, they will be totally overwhelmed by South Korea. So that's why I can tell you the real enemy for Kim Jong Il is not U.S., is not China, not Japan. It's just the South Korea. Hmm. I think th that makes the great sense to their leader and his colleagues. Um, your question, another question is about the Taiwan, I think. Yes, I have to say the China's outrage of Bob, the, 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 the arms sale to Taiwan is some sort of a partial story. We also need some sort of a reciprocal, you know, the, the, the coverage of, of such, you know, the China's strong uh, disagreement to the arms sale. So I hope over the time, Beijing's policy of Taiwan were getting more constructive and also getting more, you know, appealing to the, 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 the peoples, not just the Taiwan, but also both peoples or three peoples, Taiwanese, Chinese, uh, Americans. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think this is the end of our exercise. I once again uh, thank our panelists and also I thank all of you in the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, session three is now concluded. Thank you.